And so this is the crown trial. This looked at patients who have ALK positive non-small cell lung cancer who had not received prior treatment for metastatic disease. Patients were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to lorlatinib versus crizotinib. Um, of a note, uh, we would not really consider crizotinib an acceptable control if it were to be designed today because um, so many drugs, particularly electinib, uh, seritinib, and brigatinib were known to have better efficacy and better CNS penetration, but this is the trial as it was designed at the time that it was designed. Um, importantly, this trial did one great thing. Well, it did many great things, but it allowed for patients who had asymptomatic treated or untreated brain metastasis to be enrolled. And this is something that myself and many of my other colleagues who are, are talking today have really been championing at many um, clinical trial design meetings, which is if we think drugs are going to have CNS efficacy, or if we know from prior experience that they do have CNS efficacy, allowing patients to go on without prior radiation is going to give us a better real world population and hopefully allow many patients to avoid radiation in the future. And so um, you've seen a few of these different plots already. Essentially, this just shows the percent of patients who are progression-free survival at a specific time point, it, meaning that their cancer has not grown, it has not gone new places in the time that they've been on the drug. And so at five years, 60% of patients had no evidence of progression of their cancer. And this, um, this is quite remarkable. Uh, I think I, I was fortunate enough to be in the room at the time that this data was presented. And this is really quite a significant advance over what we have previously seen um, for patients who have ALK. This is time to intracranial progression. So uh, again, this is for patients who did receive serial MRIs of the brain, looking at if they already had brain mets or even if they didn't, how long did it take before any cancer grew or developed in the brain? And importantly, at five years, 92% of patients had no evidence of cancer progression in the brain. And for my patients, I know this is incredibly important. Your brain is your thought process. It's your personality. Um, it's the most important real estate in your body. And so being able to protect that brain space and to do it for such a prolonged period of time um, is a really important uh, movement in this field. Now, what about toxicity? And so I will say that there is a bit of, there is more toxicity with lorlatinib than with electinib, which previously had been my drug of choice. Um, but as we use lorlatinib more and more in the front line, I think we just need to get better about managing these toxicities. So hypercholesterolemia and hypertriglyceridemia are the most common. Um, I coach my patients to expect that they're going to be on some sort of statin medication. About 80% of patients end up on a statin when they use lorlatinib. And then weight increase is one of the, the big side effects of this drug that's been newer for us in learning how to manage. And so grade three weight gain is quite a significant amount. It's over 20 pounds of weight gain, which all of us know really can affect your self-image. It can affect your ability to do physical activity. For many of these patients, as Dr. Singhi has been referencing, they're young, they have families, they want to be active, they want to be able to exercise. And so this weight gain can be quite significant. And there's a lot of questions about, can we use GLP-1 agonists to help moder moderate some of this a weight gain um, and to prevent patients from experiencing such high grade toxicity. One thing that was not included in this presentation was the neurologic toxicity that can occur with lorlatinib, which can be significant. And it can be anything from just, I don't think quite as clearly as I normally did to patients who have hallucinations. And so 
that's where getting a history from a beloved family member or care partner can be incredibly important. Importantly, dose reduction did not impact the efficacy. And so this is, I think, one of the most important things that came out of that presentation was if patients are not able to tolerate 100 milligrams, we can go down to 75 milligrams or even in some cases, 50 milligrams, and the drug still retains excellent efficacy. And so I know for my patients, they're very, very hesitant to go down on the dose, even if they're having toxicity when the drug is working. But I think with this data, we can do that in a reassuring fashion and in a thoughtful fashion. So what's coming if we are using lorlatinib as frontline? Um, we have some new exciting drugs coming and I'm gonna focus on NVL655. Um, this is an ALK uh, Trek sparing tyrosine kinase inhibitor. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, with this drug, we've been able to decrease some of the toxicity that we see with the TREC side effects of lorlatinib and some of the other drugs while still maintaining excellent and even improved penetration of ALK penetration. Of ALK, uh, penetration. Here I'm gonna show you some of the lung cancer data that's been presented. And so even patients who had received prior lorlatinib uh, still had significant reduction in the size of their tumor. So 35% of patients met what we qualify as a response, even though the majority of patients, which are those who are on the bottom half of this curve, had some amount of shrinkage of their cancer. Um, these numbers also looked quite good for patients who had not previously been exposed to lorlatinib. This drug looks quite tolerable in the, in the early uh, phase one trial. The majority of toxicity is liver test um, increases, constipation, a change in taste, and some nausea. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to have this clinical trial at University of Chicago, and I have to say I've been really impressed with both the efficacy and the tolerability of this drug. Mm -hmm.